G'day guys, Dean from Blog for the Blood God here, and as many of you may know, I'm currently ranked the number one Heretic Astartes player, Chaos Space Marines player, on ITC rankings in the entire world. And I got there through hard work, determination, and the raw power of the Emperor's children. So what I want to do today is pay homage to the Emperor's children, show my respect and appreciation and gratitude by doing a full review of the new Emperor's children rules from the new Chaos Space Marines Codex. So I'm going to be going through absolutely everything from Emperor's Children. I'm going to talk about all of their Warlord traits, all of their relics, all of the various stratagems that you're going to want to use with Emperor's Children. I'm also going to be breaking down a series of different combos. And at the end of the video, I'm going to talk about a few different lists that I think we can expect to see in the competitive meta in regards to Emperor's Children. I do believe that Emperor's Children are one of the strongest legions to come out of this new codex. So coincidentally, this is also going to serve as a general CSM sort of review on what sort of competitive lists you can expect to see because I do think not only are we going to see these Emperor's Children lists because Emperor's Children are popular, but also because they're a very powerful force on the tabletop. So without further ado, let's get into this Emperor's Children Masterclass. <laughs> Alrighty, let's get stuck into it. Now this is going to be slightly different in my previous videos. I suspect this is going to be quite a long video because I'm planning to do a deep dive on Empress Children and go through absolutely everything. So instead of breaking this up into a video talking about secondary objectives or a video talking about stratagems, I'm going to combine it all into one video and then I'm going to timestamp each section. So that way you can share this video, you can watch this video, it's going to have everything that you need. But if there's something specific that you're looking for, you can use the timestamps to jump directly into that content. So without further ado, let's get into the Emperor's Children. So the first thing is the Legion trait that's worth discussing. So each time a model with this trait makes an attack, you can ignore any and all hit roll, weapon skill, and ballistic skill modifiers. And each time this model, uh, a model with this trait makes an attack on an unmodified wound roll of six, the AP is increased by one. So straight out the gate, you've got two really strong abilities here. So the ability to ignore the modifiers on anything is really good on things that are going to try and make you neg one to hit or things that are going to try and, you know, manipulate your hit rolls, which there's lots of in the game right now, and they're all really powerful. So being able to mitigate that top end of the meta, the things like your Eldar and those sorts of things is going to be really useful and going to come up a lot more often than you might think. And in addition to that, it allows you to, say, move and shoot with heavy weapons with no penalty, which is great for Blastmasters. Or it's going to allow you to advance and shoot with no penalty, which is great for your Sonic Blasters, the second profile on your Blastmasters, and all kinds of other things like Melter Guns and those sorts of things. So it's a, an all-round, it's a very good trait. It's not game-breaking, but it is very good. But the second part, where an unmodified wound roll of six gets an additional pip of AP, that's going to be very useful as well. So all in all, pretty good Legion trait. Not game-breaking, but it's definitely going to increase the overall damage output and reliability of your Emperor's Children units. Alrighty, now that we've gone through their Legion trait, let's talk about their unique secondary. Now, generally speaking, when I'm writing a list, I start with the secondaries. Pick which secondaries you want to achieve in the game, which one you think you have the capacity to achieve in most games, and then design a list that will achieve those secondaries. So the, the factions and the codexes with the best secondary objectives are often going to be the ones that are gonna dominate on the tabletop. Now, the Emperor's Children secondary, however, is not that fantastic, and here's what it does. So, if you select this objective, score one victory point at the end of each battle round for each of the following that apply. If you control more objective markers than your opponent, more enemy units were destroyed by ranged attacks made by Emperor's children from your units in this battle round than vice versa. So you've got to kill more of their ship with ranged than they kill of yours. More enemy units were destroyed by melee attacks from Emperor's children units than vice versa. So again, kill more things in combat than they kill and more enemy character units were destroyed by attacks made from Emperor's Children character units from your army in the battle round than vice versa. If all four of the above apply at the end of the battle round, score one additional victory point at the end of that battle round for a maximum of five. So in my opinion, this is going to be very rarely selected. And the main reason is that it's scored at the end of the battle round. So if, you're a if you go first, 
and you go out, your opponent gets an opportunity to go, okay, cool. You only killed one thing in shooting and you killed three things in combat, right? So they go, cool, I'm gonna ignore the combat element. I'm just gonna make sure I kill two things in shooting and that's gonna deny you that point. I can't deny you the three because I'm probably not gonna kill three or four things in combat. Uh, and it's also, you have to kill more than them, not equal to, more than. So if you kill two things, they kill two things, you're bupkis. And this is in the same category as grind them down, which is just kill more units, three victory points. Doesn't matter if it's shooting or combat, doesn't matter if they're characters or not. So more often than not, you're just gonna take grind them down over this. Uh, I just feel that the secondary is gonna fall short and I think you'd be hard pressed to find a time when you would actually wanna select this. So unfortunately that is a big loss for the Emperor's Children, but don't worry, we're gonna make up that loss with some really crazy combos later on in this video. All right, now let's go through some of the Warlord traits that you're gonna have available to you as an Emperor's Children player. All right, first up, we have Stimulated by Pain. Each time this Warlord loses a wound, add one to the attack's characteristic to a maximum of three plus, and each time this Warlord regains a lost wound, subtract one from the attack's characteristic. When this Warlord is destroyed, if it's within engagement range of enemy units that has not already fought this phase, do not remove it from play. It can, after the attacking model's units finish making its attacks, be selected to fight. After that fight has been resolved, this Warlord is removed from play. It's cool. I'll give it that, but I don't think anyone's gonna realistically spend a CP in order to get it because you're not gonna be generating those extra attacks until you've taken damage. And often, if you're taking damage, your opponent is committing to killing that character. People don't just go, oh, I'll just throw a few wounds into that character and then deal with him later. People go, oh, you've exposed your character, I'm going to kill it. So realistically, you're not gonna be getting those extra attacks. The fighting on death one is kind of cool because you would spend CP for that. You know, If you throw your Disco Lord in there or you throw someone really powerful in there and then they kill you and you want to fight on death, that's pretty powerful. So for that side of this wall of trait, you might use it. Uh, however, I realistically don't think it's gonna be worth the command point on this one, unfortunately. All right, so the next one is Intoxicating Musk. For this one, while an enemy unit is within three inches of the Warlord, each time a model in that unit makes an attack, subtract one from the attack's hit roll. Now this is really good because Empress Children characters have access to a six inch heroic intervene. So if you have a, a unit that you wanna protect, you put a character in the middle, and if somebody tries to charge you, you can heroically intervene in, you can make them fight last, and you can subtract one from their hit roll. This takes units like your Terminator Blob and it makes it just really, really hard to kill in combat. And I think the consistent theme that you're gonna see throughout this video is that Emperor's Children are going to absolutely dominate the fight phase. So this is just one of the ways that you can do it and this is a Warlord trait that I actually have seriously considered taking. All right, next up we have Unbound Arrogance, which is a sick name for a Warlord trait. Not only does it suit the Empress Children perfectly, but it suits me perfectly as well. So let's see what it does. All right, each time this Warlord is selected to fight, you and your opponent secretly choose a number from one to three on a D6. We suggest turning a D6 to show the number, concealing it behind your hand, then reveal your choices simultaneously. And if the chosen numbers differ, then until the fight is resolved, add the number of you that you chose to the attack's characteristic of the warlord. This is hot garbage. Don't ever take it. It's so bad because realistically, you've got essentially a one in three chance of this doing nothing, right? And Generally what's gonna happen is your opponent is just going to pick three. They're just gonna be like, cool, I'm just gonna pick three. So that at best, this Warlord trait is gonna give you an additional two attacks, which isn't that great considering that there's other Warlord traits that are gonna give you plus one attack and plus one strength or other things like that. So this Warlord trait, it's a cool gimmick and it's fun that you can sort of play poker with your opponent. You can be like, oh, am I picking a two or am I gonna big dick it and pick a three, you know? Um, so it's fun, but I don't think it's competitively viable. Next up, we have Faultless Duelist. Each time this Warlord makes a melee attack, you can reroll the hit roll. While an enemy model is within engagement range of this Warlord, subtract one from the attack's characteristic of that enemy model. All right, now this one is very similar to that previous one that I was highly considering. However, the difference is this one is only models within engagement range which get neg one attack, which isn't really that great. So um, ultimately, I think the, the other Warlord trait where it's neg one to hit on the unit that's within range is more powerful. 
All right, next up we have Glutton for Punishment. Each time an attack is allocated to this Warlord, if the Warlord does not have the vehicle keyword, subtract one from the damage characteristic to a minimum of one. Each time this Warlord would lose a wound as a result of a mortal wound, five plus that wound is not lost. Now this one's good. Protection from mortal wounds is good and also neg one damage is good. However, like I said before, your opponent is really only gonna be attacking a character when they're gonna commit and they're gonna kill it. So realistically, you can't take this on a Disco Lord, so the neg one damage is not that powerful because you're gonna be taking on this, you know, six or seven wound character, maybe even a five wound character. It's not that really that important. So this is cool, but I don't see it being used. All right, and last but not least, we have Loathsome Grace. This is add two to the moves characteristic to your Warlord and you can reroll advanced and charge rolls for this Warlord. Again, this is cool, plus movement, advanced and charges being rerollable does add a lot of reliability and utility to your characters. However, would you really want to spend one of your very few CP to be able to do this? Particularly when Empress Children have some really broken stratagems that really synergize well with their units. I think managing your command points is going to be the key to getting strength out of this this legion, and uh, I don't think you're gonna be wanna waste them on giving a uh, Warlord an extra couple inches worth of movement. <laughs> Alrighty, now let's talk about stratagems. Now the Empress children have some truly broken stratagems, and I think this is the thing that's gonna put them into that top bracket, the top tier CSM legions, is their stratagems, because they have some really unique abilities that shore up some of the weaknesses from the CSM codex. The first one is Cruel Bladesman. So it's a battle tactic stratagem. Use this in the fight phase when an Emperor's Children unit from your army is selected. Until the end of the phase, each time a Heretic Astartes model from that unit makes an attack, improve the AP by one. Now, this is really good, but it is two command points. So that's pretty expensive investment. You're only really gonna do this if you need to push over that threshold of damage. Increase, increasing your AP by one is quite powerful, particularly on things like Terminators and that that are already quite high in AP. Being able to take somebody who has a two-up save, an armor of contempt, and they think they're invulnerable, and being able to say, no, I'm actually pushing you all the way back to a five-up invulnerable save, is very powerful. And in certain situations, you're absolutely gonna wanna use this. So it's worth noting, it's worth keeping it in your toolkit, but it's not something that I suspect is going to be turning the tide of games often. All right, the next one is Honor the Prince. Now it's worth noting that I used to use this almost every single game, probably three to four times. This stratagem used to be in the old CSM book, absolutely busted. Now they've reworded it, they've changed the stratagem, and I still think it's a very good stratagem. It just has a slightly different use than previously. So with the new stratagem, here's what you get. All right, use the stratagem in your movement phase or your charge phase after selecting an Emperor's Children Core or Emperor's Children Demon Kin unit to advance or declare a charge. If used in your movement phase, you do not make an advance roll for that unit. Instead, until the end of the phase, add six inches to the move characteristic of models in that unit. And if used in your charge phase, do not roll 2d6 for that unit's charge roll. Instead, until the end of the charge phase, roll d6 plus six for that unit's charge roll. Now, it's worth noting that this is limited to demon kin and core, which means your characters don't really have access to it, unless they're a demon kin character. But that being said, this is quite powerful in the way that now, not only does it allow you to get that extra movement on your charges, it also allows you to use it in advances, which is quite powerful, especially because Empress Children have got an ability that allows them to advance and charge. So you could use this twice, once in the movement phase to get that six inch advance, and then once again in the charge phase to get that extra six inches to your charge. So previously, Honor the Prince worked very much deep strike in charge. Now I think it's more deploy on the table, move, advance, and then charge. I think that's the better way to use this stratagem now. Um, it's gonna cost more because you're gonna have to use it twice. Uh, but like I said, managing your CP is going to be how you're going to get a lot of mileage out of this codex. It's also worth noting with Honor the Prince that if you do go for the deep strike and charge option, you can deep strike in and previously what you would do is you'd roll 2d6 and then pick one of them and turn it into a six, which meant if you rolled a three on either of the dice, you would turn the other one into a six and you'd make it in. And you used to be able to spend a command point to CP reroll and then after that turn one into a six. So essentially you rolled four dice, as long as one of those four was a three plus, 
you were in. Now, that was like a 99% charge rate. This is you roll a D6 plus six, which means you've got a, a single dice that you roll, and as long as it is a three, you get in. And you could CP re-roll that, but you're still rolling for a three. You're essentially getting two dice and rolling to try to find a three. However, if you pair this with something like Abaddon the Despoiler, who gives core units plus one to their charge roll, you're actually now getting a two up charge from Deep Strike because you've got plus one to your charge, so that plus six from the Honor of the Prince, so that's a seven plus D6 charge, which all you need to do is roll a two and you're in. So if you pair it with Abaddon, you've got an equally reliable charge from Deep Strike, but the utility of using it for advancing charges is also there as well. So all in all, I actually think this stratagem got better. It's just, you've got to use it slightly differently. All right, next up we have Excess of Violence. Use this stratagem in your command phase if your army is engaged in either wanton destruction, wanton massacre. If you do, select one Emperor's Children infantry unit from your army until the start of your next command phase, that unit is considered to be engaged in wanton slaughter instead. So this is essentially one CP, and if you use it in turns one or two, you get exploding sixes in combat. This is something that I think people are going to be using a little bit, particularly if they're going for the old Dreadclaw and some Chosen, charge them out, you know, honor the prince their charge, and then put Wanton Slaughter on them to get those exploding sixes. It's pretty good. However, spending one CP just for each six to hit is an extra hit. Doesn't really feel that good, particularly given that it's an unmodified, so you can't stack it with prescience and there's no longer any icons of excess or anything like that to get more reliable explodes. So I don't really think I see this being used very often, but it's worth noting that it is valuable in clutch situations. Next, we have a strategic ploy called Incessant Disdain. That's one CP, use this stratagem in the heroic intervention step of your opponent's charge phase, select one Emperor's Children core Emperor's Children Demonkin, or Emperor's Children character from your army. Until the end of the phase, if that unit is not a character unit, it is eligible to perform heroic interventions as if it were a character unit. And if it is a character, it's able to perform heroic interventions if it's within six inches horizontally and five inches vertically of an enemy unit. All right, so there's two things to note here. One is this is really powerful on a unit of Terminators or a unit of Possessed that you've got holding an objective. Because those units are so big, you can actually make it so that your opponent can't touch that objective without you heroically intervening into them. Which means they can't be cheeky and put that little one obsec model on that objective and be like, ha I've stolen it. Because you'll just be like, nah, sorry mate, those guardsmen are fucked. So, <laughs> so it's really powerful for that and it gives you a really strong presence for board control. And this is why it's really important not to blow all your CP during list generation, because there are gonna be situations where you're going to need to do this. So you wanna make sure you have two or three command points at, at the start of every turn, so that you can do these sorts of stratagems when called upon. Interestingly, the character one, it says you can perform a heroic intervention if your opponent's within six inches instead of within three. However, it doesn't say that you get to move six inches. I believe this will be FAQ because clearly the intent is that you can, if they're within six inches, you can heroically intervene into them. There wouldn't be much point using the stratagem if you were capped at a three inch move when they're six inches away. So I believe the intent is for it to be able to allow you to slingshot in, which if FAQ'd and if it does work that way, this is really powerful because Emperor's Children characters have access to fight lasts for two CP. So you can put an Emperor's Children character in the middle of your unit, and then if your opponent charges it, you can go, cool, one CP to heroically intervene, now I'm within three inches of you. Then two more CP, now you fight last, and then my possessed just fucking blow you up. So this is really powerful. And not only that, it stacks really well with the Emperor's Children. If you have icons in the unit, they get always fights first. So now you're able to combo both of those things together. All right, next we have a very Emperor's Children sounding stratagem called Death Ecstasy. Use this stratagem in your fight phase when an Emperor's Children infantry unit from your army is selected as the target of a melee attack. Until the end of that phase, each time a model in that unit is destroyed by a melee attack, if that model has not yet fought in this phase, do not remove it from play. The destroyed model can fight after the attacking unit has finished making its attacks and then is removed from play. 
All right, so this is obviously very powerful. It is two CP, so once again, you wanna make sure you're managing your CP well, but that two CP to fight on death means that if you do have a unit of possessed run out or a unit of terminators run out and you get, they just bombard you. You're versing blood angels and they throw, you know, two units of Sangard and a unit of death company in and they're like, cool, you're gonna make one of them fight last, but then the other two are gonna fight and they're gonna kill you, right? Well, then you go, cool story. I'm gonna spend two CP instead of making you fight last, I'm gonna spend two CP to fight on death. And now, yes, you're going to kill that unit, but I'm going to kill you as well. So really powerful, um, and it's definitely something that's gonna really switch the game up when your opponent goes, well, fuck, now I can't fight them because they'll either make me fight last or they'll fight on death and just kill me. So it's kind of combining the best parts of the Emperor's Children with the best parts of the creations of Bile and allowing you to sort of operate in both of those modes. So this is a very, very powerful strategy. All right, the next one is Sephoric Gaze which is uh, basically allows you to use this stratagem at the study of fight phase, select one Emperor's Children character model from your army and then select one enemy unit within three inches of it. That enemy unit is not eligible to fight in the fight phase until all other units have done so. So this is the one I mentioned earlier. It's really powerful. You put your character in the middle of a unit and then you basically can heroically intervene. This is also really good if you want to just charge something from, you know, Deep Strike or something like that and just call, cool, you fight last. I'm going to do two charges. That one fights last. Now I'm going to fight here first and you can't CP interrupt and then I get to fight there as well. It's very powerful and wielded well. This is going to do a lot of work. All right, next we have Combat Elixirs. Previously, this was a pre-game stratagem that you used to buff up your units. Now it's something that you can do uh, on any unit during the game, which is, in my opinion, much better because it allows you to sort of spread your buffs out throughout the army. You don't, you're not committed to it at the start of the game, and here's what it does. Use this stratagem when an Emperor's Children core or Emperor's Children character unit from your army is selected to fight. Until the end of the phase, add one to the strength characteristic of models in that unit and improve the weapon skill characteristics of models in that unit by one. Okay, so this is really good because basically what this does is it's only two CP, which again is quite expensive, but it allows you to increase the strength and AP of your units. So it allows you to just go, cool, I'm versing a knight. Well, I'm gonna spend this stratagem because it's gonna get me, instead of winning on sixes, I'm gonna be winning on fives now. You know, so it's kind of using the long war or the veterans of the long war, but it's also increasing your AP by one. Now granted, in not, not in every situation, that plus one strength is going to help. So for example, if you're, you know, Terminators, which is strength five, and you're going into a Rhino, which is tough to seven, being strength five or strength six isn't gonna matter. But the AP is also quite good. So this is something that you're gonna have to sort of weigh up on a case by case situation, but it's an amazing tool to have in your tool belt for those situations when it does matter. All right, and last but not least, we have one of my previous favorite stratagems, which has now been nerfed into a stratagem that I no longer really consider valuable, which was excruciating frequencies. This used to just give you plus one damage to all your sonic weapons. Here's what it does now. Use this stratagem in your shooting phase when an Emperor's Children unit from your army is selected to shoot. Until the end of the phase, each time a model in that unit makes an attack with a sonic weapon, on an unmodified wound roll of six, the target suffers one model wound in addition to the normal damage and cannot suffer more than six model wounds per phase as a result of this stratagem. After the unit's finished making its shooting attacks, that one enemy unit that was hit by an attack made with the sonic weapon by a model in this unit this phase, until the start of your next turn, the enemy unit cannot fight Overwatch or set to defend. So realistically, you're gonna be dropping down. If you drop down with a unit of 10, you might do a few mortal wounds here, but it's on an unmodified six to wound. So unless you're fully loaded out with sonic blasters and you're re-rolling your wounds and that sort of stuff, then you're gonna probably get the six. But, and in which case one CP to do six mortal wounds is very good. Uh, however, I think the Empress Children will be taking a slightly different route where the sonic weapons are going to be more limited and I don't really see this stratagem being used anywhere near as often as it used to, at least. All right, now let's talk relics. Now it's worth saying that in the similar vein to the Warlord traits, there's some really cool relics in here. However, I think Emperor's Children players are going to need to learn to be very conservative with their command point usage because you're gonna be wanting use, to use those command points to do various stratagems throughout the game. So wasting them all early by trying to make a unit that's really you know, a character that's got a warlord trait and a relic and he goes in and kill, like, I think that's going to be a, a, a bit of a mistake. So we're gonna go through these relics, but just bear in mind that those command points are very, very useful later on. So be careful not to spend them all during list creation. 
All right, first up we have the Endless Grin. So this is an infantry model only, so no Disco Lords. Uh, each time the bearer would lose a wound, roll a d6. On a six, that wound is not lost. So a six up, feel no pain. And then once per battle, when the bearer is destroyed, you can use this relic instead of any other rules that are triggered when the bearer is destroyed. If you do so, mark the bearer's position, remove the bearer from the battlefield. At the end of the phase, roll a d6. On a three up, the bearer is set back up on the battlefield as close as possible to the position you marked and not with an engagement range of enemy units with d3 wounds remaining. All right, so you've got a six up feel no pain, which makes you quite durable, and it allows you to bring that character back. I don't think it's gonna be realistically worth it because ultimately you wanna be protecting your characters and a savvy opponent, if they're able to kill that character, say in the shooting phase, they're going to have positioned themselves in such a way that when you bring them back, they either have more shooting or they're gonna charge you and kill you. So ultimately it might buy you a little bit of time at best, but I don't necessarily think it's that valuable. All right, Fatal Sonnency. So Empress Children model only, at the end of your movement phase, you can select one enemy unit within 12 inches and visible to the bearer, roll a d6 for every four plus that suffers a model wound. Again, this is something where it's like, cool, you're gonna be doing a bunch of model wounds throughout the game, that's cool, but I don't think we wanna be spending CP to make our characters doing damage. I think we wanna utilize our characters for their abilities and the way that they can enhance our units and then you use your units to do the damage. So anytime there's a wall or trader or a relic that allows your characters to do more damage, I immediately discard it based on that premise. Armor of Abhorrence is an Emperor's Children model only. This bearer has the following ability, Armor of Abhorrence Aura. Each time an enemy unit, excluding Titanic units, within three inches of the bearer is selected to fall back, roll a d6 on a four plus, that unit cannot fall back this turn. This is pretty good. Um, being able to stop somebody from falling back forces them to remain engaged in combat with you. And if you have the ability to always fight first in combat, that means that you're gonna to get to fight them again before they strike. That's pretty cool. So it pairs well with the Emperor's Children. However, it is on a four plus. So it's something that you're not going to be building your game plan around. You're not gonna be relying on it because it's only a 50% chance it's gonna happen. And if you can't rely on something, it shouldn't be in your list. All right, here we have my old favorite, the Remnant of Mara Vigilia which was previously a six inch aura of re-roll all wounds, which was absolutely insanely good value. It's still decent value, but it has changed significantly since the last book. All right, now it's an Emperor's Children Priest model only. Once per battle at the end of your command phase, the bearer can use this relic. If it does so until the start of your next command phase, if the bearer has the following ability which is an aura while friendly Emperor's Children core or Emperor's Children character unit is within six inches of the bearer, add one to the attacks characteristics of models in that unit. All right, so we've gone from re-rolling all of our wounds to getting additional attacks. It's still very good, but I don't think it makes the cut. You've got to sort of think of it like, well, would you spend a CP to get plus one attack on units within six inches? Yes. However, knowing that you have to do it in command phase, knowing that it doesn't affect demon kin units, knowing all of these sorts of things, is it something that you're really gonna bake in? And also it's a once per game thing, so you really need to get your timing right. I think it's cool and I think certain builds will use this to great effect. However, I don't think this is an auto include and I don't think you're gonna see this in every list of the Emperor's Children. All right, next up we have a weapon. Now, weapon relics are something that I normally discard out of hand. Like I said earlier, anytime you're trying to use CP to make your characters more killy, you're often wasting those CP, and you're often better off spending those CP making sure that your units get to do the damage that they do. Because most units, for their points, put out more damage than characters. This could potentially be one exception, because if you pair this relic with some Warlord traits, you actually get a very serious beat stick. So here's what this relic does. It's called Distortion. Emperor's Children model with a Power Sword, Force Sword, or a Cursed Weapon only. This relic replaces the Power Sword, Force Sword, or a Cursed Weapon. It has the following profile. So it's got two, basically it's got two profiles. Each time it's, uh, you make an attack, you can select one of the profiles. You've got Elegant Incision, which is a strength user melee AP2, one damage, but you get to make two hit rolls instead of one for each attack. And the other is Inelegant Slash, which is a strength times two AP4-2 damage. All right, so basically this is, it sounds quite underwhelming, right? Because you're, you're basically making a whole bunch of strength four, you know, one damage attacks. However, you're making two hit rolls for each attack. And if you pair this 
with the various warlord traits and other ways that you can get increased attacks on that guy. You can get this guy up to 10 attacks, which means he goes in with 20 slashes and he just fucking shreds. So this is really good. And you can also pair that with the warlord trait that allows you to do sixes to wound, do a mortal wound. So now you're getting a lot of attacks which means a lot of opportunities to roll those sixes to do a lot of mortal wounds. So it's interesting, there are a few different combos. However, ultimately, I still fall back on my initial principle, which is that you don't wanna be doing your damage with your characters, you wanna be doing damage with units. All right, next we have the Rainment Revulsive. This is an Emperor's Children model only. The Relic can be given to a Cultist model. The Bearer has the following ability. While a friendly Empress Children units within six inches of the bearer, that unit can perform an action and can shoot without the action failing. While an enemy unit's within six inches of the bearer, that enemy unit cannot start to perform an action. This is cool. Actions are a really big part of the game now, particularly with the Nephilim changes. A lot of the secondaries are a lot harder to achieve. So you're gonna be falling back onto those objectives that are based around doing actions, and so is your opponent. So combining those two things together is quite interesting. However, there's not a great deal of powerful shooting in this codex. So you're often not going to be doing that much damage with your shooting, so it's not really worth spending the CP to get a relic that means you have to position your character in such a way that is nearby the units, that are nearby the objectives, that they're trying to do the action. It's just, it's too much. I think you're better off going with your raw power from units and just fucking smashing your opponents. And if there's something that you want doing in actions, get a second unit to do the action. I don't think you want to be spending your CP, your hard-earned, valuable CP, giving certain units within certain positions the ability to shoot their insignificant guns and do an action. I just don't think it's worth it. All right, the next stratagem worth considering is called Murderous Perfection. It's one CP and here's what it does. Use this stratagem in your shooting phase or the fight phase when a traitorous Astartes Slanesh unit is selected to shoot or fight. Once during that phase, when resolving an attack made by a model in that unit, you can change the result of one hit roll, one wound roll, or one damage roll to a six. Note that if a d3 is being rolled as a part of that damage roll, that six is halved to a three. All right, so this is quite powerful, and there's a very specific way that you need to use this, because it's basically you do it when you roll that damage. So what you want to do is you want to slow roll, because if you fast roll, if you go, cool, I'm gonna use the CP, and then you fast roll your wounds, you're gonna be like, nah, I failed one wound. Do I really wanna spend a, that, use the CP to make that into a six? Nah, depends on what these are, I don't know. Then you roll, they roll their saves, and they pass one of them, and then you got three go through, and then you roll it, and you, you rolled, you know, three sixes, then you don't wanna use the strat. However, knowing that they were all sixes, you might have wanted to go re-roll that wound. Or you might have wanted to go, sorry, not re-roll, you might have wanted to go turn that wound into a six. So the way to do this is you roll, or you say you got a unit with four melter guns in it, because you can put four melter guns in a Terminator unit. What you want to do is instead of rolling four hits, four wounds, and then four damage, you want to go, cool, I'm rolling my first one, it hits, then I'm going to roll to wound, then I'm going to roll to damage. And if you roll a one for the damage, you go, cool, I'm going to use murderous perfection, turn that into a six. But if you roll a six for the damage, then you go, cool, I'm not going to spend it now, I'm gonna do my next shot. Roll a hit, roll a wound, roll your damage. And if you get to that fourth one and you haven't used it yet, and then you roll hit, and then you roll and you fail to wound, well now would be the time to use it because you haven't got any value out of it. You haven't needed to use it yet. You haven't needed to get any value out of it. Now is the time to use it. So in those situations, this can be quite powerful. And also in those situations when you, you've got a character there and he's got you know, five wounds left in your roll, you've got one melter gun hit goes through, one wound goes through, oh, he fails his save. And you're like, yes, and then you roll a one for the damage and you're like, actually, nah, fuck yeah. And then you can turn it to a six and just kill him. So this is definitely one to keep in your tool belt and definitely one to plan around, but it's not something that you're going to use in every game in every situation. Next, we have Excessive Cruelty. Amazing name for a stratagem. Use this stratagem when an enemy unit within engagement range of a traitor of studies unit from your army falls back. After that enemy unit has finished that move, select one traitor of studies Slanesh unit from your army that the enemy unit was within engagement range of when the stratagem was used, that Slanesh unit can either consolidate three inches if it's no longer within engagement range, or 
can shoot as if it were the movement uh, shooting phase. If you selected Selenish unit shoots, it can only shoot the target that fell back. Okay, so this is pretty cool on a few different things. So for example, if you have a big Terminator brick with a whole ton of flamers in it, which I really like that build because of the new flamers, the let the galaxy burn ability. If you have that and your opponent goes to fall back, you're like, cool, here's like 30 flamer hits. Have fun with that, right? So that's really good. But I think a lot of the utility from this is going to be if they fall back, you can then consolidate three inches. And the trick here is stringing yourself out in such a way that you're within three inches of multiple units. And then they go, cool, I'm going to fall back with this unit in their movement phase. And then you go, cool, well, I'm going to spend the CP and I'm going to consolidate three inches and I'm actually going to tag that unit. So now you can't shoot me. So you thought you were falling back so that you could shoot me with everything. But if you're smart about it and the way, so, you know, if the situation presents itself, you can actually use this to get yourself back into combat before their shooting phase. So this can be really, really powerful in certain situations, and you need to know how to sort of line up those situations. So if you've got a Terminator unit that's holding the midfield, and it's, you know, it's that second, third turn when you're gonna go do a charge, make sure that when you charge, you're not only just hitting the unit that you're targeting, you're also stringing out in such a way that you're near their other units. And then when your opponent decides to fall back, you go, cool, spending CP, and now I'm touching those units as well, which means you can't shoot me. And then also, if you have the always fights first, you're gonna fight those units before they fight you because you, hero you essentially heroically intervened. So very, very powerful stratagem in very niche situations. All right, let's talk about the Mark of Slanesh. Now this is something that every unit in your army that has access to marks must take. Now this is probably one of the biggest taxes on the Emperor's children because everything has to have this. However, things like your possessed, things like your, you know, your vehicles and stuff like that that don't have access to marks, they don't have to take this. However, being in an Emperor's children army, they do gain the Slanesh keyword. So it's very important to note that because that means that you can do things like delightful agonies on the possessed because they have the Slanesh keyword even though they don't have the mark of Slanesh. All right, let's talk about what the mark of Slanesh actually does. All right, if this unit starts the fight phase with an engagement range of enemy units, it fights first in that phase. And if this unit has an icon keyword, each time the model in this unit makes a melee attack, add one to the attack's hit roll. Now, unfortunately, a lot of the strong units like Possessed, Terminators, those sorts of things, they actually can't take icons. So you don't get the plus one to the hit rolls side of this. Um, however, your Emperor's Children, um, Noise Marines, things like that, that's only five points for, a, for an icon and that gives them that extra weapon skill. It's definitely very valuable. Um, and on your characters, they also don't get icons. So the icon component of this is going to see very little play, I think. However, that always fights first for the Marcus Slanesh, which is going to be on your Terminator units. It's going to be on all of your characters. It's going to be on things like your Raptors. That's very powerful because it allows you to make sure that you're getting essentially free interrupts, but it also pairs very well with the fight's last ability that they have through stratagems. And I'll go through in detail later in the video how that works. All right, now let's talk about some of the generic relics that are available through any Slanesh model or any, any model in the various legions that pair very well with the Emperor's Children. So first up, we have Tharis and Riol, the Rapacious. So this is a uh, selected model with two or more melee weapons, excluding relics. Select two of those weapons, excluding relics, the bearer is equipped with. Those weapons are now both relics for all rule purposes and both have the demon weapon ability. This model still only counts as being equipped with one relic, however. Each time the bearer is selected to fight, it can make an additional D3 attacks with each of these demon weapons roll separately for each. Again, this is very cool, but like I said earlier, you're spending command points to unlock relics that increase the damage output of your characters, which is something I think we should be trying to avoid doing. However, there is one combo that you can create with a, a Chaos Lord that is worth considering, and I'll go through that later in the video. All right, next up we have the Mantle of Traders. Once per battle, if the bearer is selected for an epic deed stratagem, that stratagem costs zero CP. Each time the bearer makes a melee attack, you can reroll the hit roll. And at the start of your command phase, select one legion core unit from your army that is on the battlefield. Uh, until the start of your next command phase, that unit is considered to be in range of any of the following aura abilities the Chaos character has. So Lord, Chaos Lord, Aspire to Glory, and Demagogue. 
All right, this is really good. Uh, it's gonna be an interesting one and I'm really on the fence on whether or not this is an auto include or just something that you might consider. And that's because you get to do an epic deed stratagem for free. So you're spending a CP during list generation, but you're gaining access to an epic deed for free. And the fight's last stratagem is an epic deed. So you're gonna to wanna to be doing that in most games. So the question here is, is it worth spending one CP in your list generation to get a two CP stratagem for free? That is a no brainer. However, that two CP stratagem is something that you're not always going to use. So in the games where you don't use it, this is a bad decision. In the games where you do use it, it's a very good decision. So this is going to be meta dependent. If you're in a meta that's full of things like knights and tau and guard and just dacker, and you're like, cool, I don't care if I make them fight last, they're not gonna be doing much to me. Well, then this is bad because you're not gonna be spending a CP to save two CP if you don't spend the two CP, right? Just not spending it saves it. So if you're in a, a very shooting dominated meta, then that's not gonna matter. However, if you're in a very combat dominated meta, this is a, a no brainer. It's a very powerful strategy. So this will be up to the individual and it'll depend on the meta that you're in on whether or not this is something that you value. All right, the next one is the Black Rune of Damnation. Now this is arguably the most broken relic in the book, arguably one of the most broken relics in the game. So basically you can give this model, this relic to cultist models, but you can also give it to non-cultist models as per the standard relic rules. Uh, and each time an attack is made against the bearer's unit, subtract one from that attack's wound roll. The bearer has the following ability, Black Rune of Damnation Aura. While an enemy Psyker is within 18 inches of the bearer, each time a psychic test is made for that unit, it suffers a Perils of the Warp roll on any double. So this is going to be key to unlocking the power for most Chaos Space Ring builds. I think you'd be hard pressed to find a Chaos Space Ring list that doesn't include this relic. And it's usually going to be on a unit of Terminators because there's a one CP thing that is, a, I think it's called Aspiring Lord or something like that, or Trophies of the Long War. Uh, basically it allows you to give a relic to a Sergeant from a unit. So you can take that Terminator Champion and you can put the Black Rune on him. And now that Terminator unit, which is T4, has Neg1 to be wounded. And then through other combinations, you can buff them up to T5, which means that strength four guns are gonna be wounding you on sixes. Strength five guns are only gonna be wounding you on fives. Very, very powerful, because strength eight guns are now only wounding you on fours instead of previously, they would be wounding you on twos. It's so freaking powerful. I love this relic, and I think you're gonna see it in every CSM build. The other way to do it is to put it on a unit possessed because they're innately toughness five, and then you can, through the different powers and stuff, make them toughness six, which is quite strong. However, I think the two plus save of the Terminators it increases that durability, and then when you layer this on top, you get a true Death Star. All right, next up we have Intoxicating Elixir, Slanesh model only. Once per battle at the start of the fight phase, the bearer can use the relic if it does so until the end of that phase, at D3 to the attacks characteristic of the bearer, and the bearer cannot lose more than three wounds in this phase. Any wounds that are lost after that are not lost. So this is really good um, in the way that, like the D3 attacks, who cares? You're, you're adding damage to a character, which once again is not necessarily the best way to go. However, being able to only take three damage means that you can throw your character in, activate this relic, and then fight somewhere else, knowing that when your opponent fights here, they're only gonna do three, and your character's still gonna get to fight. So it's almost a pseudo fights last because you're able to make sure that they, if they interrupt, they're not gonna kill the character anyway, in which case they're not gonna bother interrupting. So it allows you to go, cool, I'm gonna have a fight here. I'm gonna have this character's gonna make that unit fight last. This character's gonna use his thing so you can only take three damage. And then this character over here is say it's Lucius and he's gonna make them fight last, right? Which means you fight first here and then you effectively get to fight first there, there, and there, and nothing your opponent can really do can stop you from getting to fight with all four of those things without them being able to interrupt at all. So this is really, really powerful if used in that way. However, your characters aren't really doing that much damage. So I don't necessarily think that this is going to be in every list. There might be some situations where you consider it though. All right, next up we have the Liber Hereticus, which is a very powerful stratagem for your psychers. So psycher model only, in your psychic phase, the bearer can attempt to manifest one additional psychic power. Each time the bearer successfully manifests a psychic power, add six inches to the range of that power's effects. 
If that psychic power specifies multiple ranges, for example, gives to chaos, it only affects the first range specified in that power. So this is pretty cool. It allows you to use your psychers to cast multiple things, which is quite powerful. Uh, and there's also a stratagem which allows you to cut, do a psychic action and cast a power. And because this allows you to cast an additional power, I believe that the, the way that this will work is that you go, cool, I'm going to do a psychic action. I'm going to spend a CP to allow me to cast one psychic power as well. And then I'm going to use my relic to cast one additional psychic power. So I can see an argument for this going either way. And we definitely need an FAQ because is the stratagem locking you to only one and therefore not an additional? Or is it their way of sort of saying, well, a sorcerer normally gets to cast two. So we're going to make it so we can only cast one. I would argue that this relic supersedes that because it supersedes the data sheet and the data sheet says you can cast two. Well, this allows you to cast an additional. So clearly this overrides the data sheet. So I don't see why it wouldn't override the relic. But it is interesting because the relic overrides the data sheet as well. So let me know in the comments below how you think this is going to be worded. But as far as I'm concerned and for the tournaments that I run and the ones that I TO for, I think that this works because one is allowing an additional and one is allowing one. Well, one plus an additional is two. So that's how I think it's going to work. And if it does work that way, it's very powerful because it means that you can have a master of executions who's going to sit there and he's going to psychic interrogate people. And then you're going to cast one of your psychic powers to buff up, say, your nearby Terminator unit. And then you can use this to cast an additional power, which is going to allow you to do even more so resurrecting models or putting plus one to wound on things. So I think this is going to be a more or less an auto clued on a master of possessions. All right, now let's get into the psychic powers. So every model in your army that has a psychic tree that is using the dark hereticus discipline, not the malefic one. If they're using the um, dark hereticus discipline, they gain delightful agonies, which is one of the more powerful psychic powers that we have access to. And basically what that does is it allows you to uh, it's a warp charge value of 6. If manifested, select a friendly Slanesh unit within 18 inches of the Psyker until the start of the next Psyker phase. Each time a model in that unit would lose a wound roll on a D6 roll of a 5+, plus, that wound is not lost. So this is really good because not only does it give you the 5-up Fiona Pain on your buffed up durable Terminator units, but if you're positioned in such a way where your opponent is nowhere near the Terminators, you can actually put it on the Possessed as well and then send the Possessed in. And with three wounds, Toughness 5 and Armor of Contempt 3-up save, you put a 5-up Feel No Pain on top of that and then it's a very, very tough unit as well. So it allows you to have multiple tough units running around the table and be, create a real big headache for your opponent. The downside to this is that you can't take it on a Master of Possessions, which means you're either going to have to bring a Sorcerer, a Demon Prince, or a unit of Legionnaires with a Balefire Tome, because if they have the Mark of Slanesh, they're going to have the Slanesh keyword. They're drawing their powers from the Heretic Astartes, or the, whatever it's called, the Dark Hereticus Discipline, which means they will gain access to this power. All right, let's get into the psychic powers available to the Master of Possessions. All right, Warp Marked. This is a Malediction. It's got a Warp Charge value of 7. If manifested, select one enemy unit within 18 inches of the Psyker until the start of your next Psyker phase. Each time a friendly Legion Demon Kin or Legion Demon Engine model makes an attack against that unit, add one to the attack's wound roll. Obviously, it's very good. It is a Warp Charge 7, which is difficult to get off. However, remember, you can use his Ritual Dagger to get plus two to your casts. And you could potentially pair it with Venom Crawlers if you really wanted to buff that probability up. And going in and making some, picking something as a target and then sending Possessed in or sending other Demon Engines in to get that plus one to wound is very powerful. All right, next up, we have one of the most broken psychic powers in the game, which is called Pact of Flesh. All right, so it's a blessing. It's got a warp charge value of five. If manifested, select a friendly Legion core or Legion demon kin or Legion character unit within 18 inches of the Psyker. One model from that unit regains D3 lost wounds. If you selected a core or a demon kin unit and that unit is not at its starting strength, one destroyed model is added back to the unit with its full wounds remaining. So this is very, very powerful, particularly given the innate durability and the problematic nature of those core and demon kin units. So you can take that Terminator unit, you can put the black rune on them, you can make them plus one toughness from various sources, you can do all of these sorts of things. And then if your opponent is able to crack through it, you can res models. So not only does it increase the durability of your units massively, 
but it also allows you to do some really shenanigan-y sort of stuff with movement, where basically you've got the unit of Terminators, they get a five inch move. Well, what you can do is you can advance them, so they're moving five plus D6. And if you want to honor the Prince, you can make that an 11 inch move. Then in the psychic phase, you can use your ritual dagger to kill one of the Terminators, then use Pact of Flesh to resurrect that model and place him at the front of the unit. So now you've got that 11 inches plus two inches worth of coherency, plus an inch and a half base. You've gained an extra three and a half inches worth of movement there. Then you can honor the Prince charge for a six plus D6 charge. So you can actually take that unit of Terminators that's in the center of the table and you can touch pretty much anything on the table. So basically the way I see the Emperor's Children working is you can take your Terminator unit with all your characters in it, you advance that up into the center of the table. It's durable enough that your opponent's gonna hit it with a bunch of stuff and not kill it. Then in your turn two, you're charging whatever it is that you want to charge. Unless your opponent is very tricky with their screening units, it's going to be very difficult for them to prevent your Terminators from hitting something that they want to kill. All right, next up we have Possession. So this is a Witch Fire. It has a Wolf Charge value of six. If manifested, select one enemy unit within nine inches and invisible to the Psyker. Roll a D6, adding one to the result if the result of the Psychic Test was an unmodified 10 plus. If the result is greater than the toughness characteristic of one model in that unit selected by your opponent is destroyed. Then if that unit has not been destroyed, the unit suffers D3 mortal wounds in addition. So this is really powerful if you play it and plan around it. So if you take the master of possessions and you put something nearby that he can use a ritual dagger on to get plus two to his cast, and then you have a couple of Morlefiends near, uh, not Morlefiends, sorry, a Venom Crawlers nearby, and that allows you to get further buffs to the cast, then the probability of you getting that 10 plus increases exponentially. And this uh, is also not the closest enemy unit. It's just an enemy unit within nine inches. So if you can do that and also get him within nine inches of a character, you can just go, you're dead. Really powerful against things like Sisters of Battle who have a lot of toughness three characters, which allows you to just go in and go, cool, this model's removed, that model's removed, very powerful. And it's also very powerful against things like your Paladin Death Stars or your Terminator Death Stars in the CSM or any anything where they're like, they've got this unit that's really, really hard to kill the models in that unit. You can just go, cool, well, I'm just going to remove one and do D3 Mortal Wounds to another. So that's very powerful. However, it's very limited in range and it requires a lot of combo work for it to really be reliable. So I don't think this is something that's going to be taken too often, but it is something that's worth considering because depending on your local meta, this might be very powerful. If you've got a lot of ad mech players, you've got a lot of sisters of battle players, you've got a lot of you know various things that have got characters that you want to try and snipe out, or you've got a lot of really tough things that you struggle to remove models from, like say a unit of crisis suits or something like that, then this can be more useful. So I'll leave that up to you guys to decide based on your local meta. Personally, I don't think I'll be taking this, but it is very interesting. All right, speaking of interesting and speaking of powerful, this is my next second pick for the most powerful psychic powers in this book, which is Mutated Invigoration. So it's a blessing. It's got a warp charge value of six. If manifested, it's like one friendly legion unit within 18 inches of the psyker until the start of your next psychic phase add one to either the strength or the toughness characteristic of models in that unit if the result of the psychic test was a 10 plus and you selected a demon kin or demon engine add one to both of these characteristics instead so the way i see it working is you're going to have a big unit of terminators in the center protecting your characters like i said before and this psychic power allows you to push those terminators to toughness five which when you have the Black Rune of Damnation makes them very difficult to kill. So I think this is an auto include just for that. And then as your opponent whittles down that unit, you can then start going, okay, well, it's no longer that valuable here because the Terminators turn three and the Terminators have been taken a pounding. I'm gonna now put it on my Possessed. And then if you get it on a 10 plus, you Possessed are going in with Strength and Toughness six, which makes them just insane. So there's a lot of play here. Um, and I think this is a very powerful psychic power that's going to be almost every Chaos Space Marine list. All right, let's talk about some of the prayers that are available to your Dark Apostle. So the first one is the prayer that you get from being Marcus of Slaanesh. So you get this in addition to your other prayers. So basically your Dark Apostle is going to go in with this prayer. He gets the reroll hits prayer and one that you can select from the table. 
Uh, if this prayer is heard, select one friendly legion slanesh core or legion slanesh character unit from you, uh, unit within six inches of this priest. That unit is eligible to declare a charge in a turn in which they advanced. So this, again, like I said before, this pairs really well with that Terminator unit that you've got in the center of the table. Your character's protected by it, and that turn that you do decide to send forth when you know, okay, your opponent's in a position where they're not going to be able to use their units to kill your characters, you can then advance using one of the prints to get those Terminators to fly across the table. Very, very powerful. The next big one that you're going to want to know about is Illusory Supplication. If this prayer is heard, select one friendly Legion core, Legion cultist, or Legion character unit from within six inches of the priest. Uh, each time an attack is made against the unit, an unmodified hit roll of one, two, or three for the attack fails, irrespective of any abilities that the weapon or the model making the attack may have. The attack's hit roll cannot be re-rolled. So this is transhuman against hits. So people have been calling it trans hitman. And basically, this is just insane because it pairs so well with the durability of that unit because now you've got a big Terminator unit in the middle. It can't be hit on one, two, or three. You can't reroll to hit against it. It's toughness five. You neg one to wound against it. And if you put Delight Flagonies on it as well, it's like, Jesus, like good luck killing this thing. And what will eventually happen is that when you tell your opponent you have all these things, they're just not going to bother. They're going to target other things because they're going to know, oh my God, if I dedicate my whole army, I probably kill like three. And then in your turn, you're going to heal one and resurrect another. And then it's like, what have I even achieved here? So I think doing this, not only is this going to make the unit so tough, it's actually going to make it so tough that your opponent's not even going to try. They're going to try and kill everything else. So there's a lot of power in this, and this is why I think that the priest is gonna make an auto include because his ability to make things advance and charge and his ability to make them that hard to hit is just so good for like 95 points. All right, another warlord trait that's worth considering is Flames of Spite. Each time this warlord makes an attack, you can reroll the attack's wound roll, and each time it makes an attack an unmodified wound roll of a six, the target suffers one mortal wound in addition to any other normal damage. So. Again, I'm not a huge fan of spending CP pre-game to increase the damage output of your characters, but this, if you pair it with certain relics and you pair it on a combo, like a Disco Lord or something like that, that's got a lot of attacks, this can actually yield a reliable number of mortal wounds and reroll wounds is nothing to turn your nose up at either. So this is quite a powerful relic and realistically, if you're in a situ if you're if you've got a character in the game that you would spend a CP to give them reroll wounds, or you'd spend a CP to do mortal wounds, well, why not spend that one CP at the start of the game to get both of those abilities? All right, that more or less covers most of the uh, the various components of the Empress Children and what's good and what's not. Now let's talk about some very specific combos that I think are going to be great used in an Empress Children list. So the first one is the Durable Terminators, which I banged on about a whole bunch throughout the video, but I'm gonna sort of combine all of those elements now and talk about it. So you take 10 Terminators with as many Chain Fists and as many Flamers as you can afford. So depending on how many points you have available, this is a really good place where you can spend those extra five to 10 points that sort of round out your list. Then you spend one pre-game CP to give them the Black Rune of Damnation. Then you put a Dark Apostle in the middle of that unit so that he's protected and he chants Illusionary Supplication turn one. Then when you're ready to launch a charge, he chants Blissful Devotion to grant advance and charge of the Terminators. Combined with Honor the Prince, this is a potential of 17 plus 2d6 threat range. All right, next you put a Master of Possessions with the Liber Hereticus in the middle as well. He casts Mutated Invigoration to make them Toughness five, which pairs with the Black Rune so that Strength four or lower weapons wound you on a six plus. Strength five weapons only wound you on a five plus and strength six to 10 weapons only wound you on a four plus. Then with your second power, you're gonna be casting Warp Marked to give you plus one to wound on your possessed units that are nearby if you have them or your demon engines. And then with your third power, you're gonna cast Pact of Flesh. You can use this to return dead Terminators to the unit and extend their threat range even further. And every time you cast one of these powers, you're gonna use his Ritual Dagger to inflict one mortal wound on those Terminators, which you can then use to make sure that one of them is going to die because you're inflicting 3d3, which is a minimum of three. And that allows you to definitely have a dead model, which you can then bring back further. 
So that's one combo, and that's something that I think is going to be the sort of cornerstone of the Empress Children list, is that really tough unit of Terminators that's going to be doing a ton of damage and is very hard to kill. Combine that with the fact that it's going to protect your characters, which protects you from Assassinate, and those characters also have the Heroic Intervention and Fight Last ability, which protects the Terminators. So it's a symbiotic relationship where the two units protect each other very, very well, and allows you to dominate the midfield. All right, next we have the way that Emperor's Children can make it so that units never fight last. So a Mark of Slaanesh means that you always fight first. Lucius and other characters can make enemy units fight last. So this means if you charge someone and they use a fight last ability on you, say they've got the Silent King or something to that effect, your fights first cancels out with their ability that makes you fight last. So you fight normally and then you can make them fight last. So as a result, you will fight before them. And if somebody charges you and makes you fight last, well, you can do the same thing. Your fights, the fights last they put on you is cancelled out by your fights first, so you fight normally, but you can make them fight last. In this situation, even if they had both fights first and fights last, and you both had both, you would be treated as having neither, in which case you would fight first because the player whose turn it is not activates first, so you'd still fight before them. And if it's an ongoing combat, you would do the same thing. So the result here is that if you have a combination of Emperor's Children characters and Mark of Slaanesh units, that unit can never be made to fight last, which is so powerful because one of the biggest things that Chaos Space Marines struggled with previously was if your opponent can make you fight last, you didn't have the innate durability to survive their fight, which meant you just couldn't ever charge them. Whereas now the tables have turned and we have the durability, we have the damage output, and we have the ability to make them fight last. So this is going to allow Empress Children to absolutely dominate the fight phase and mastering this is going to be the key to success with Empress Children. All right, next up we have a beat stick Chaos Lord. Now, like I said several times throughout this video, I'm generally not a huge proponent of making a character into a beat stick. However, this is how you would do it if you wanted to. And also it's worth noting that one of the CSM secondaries requires you to kill units with your characters. So if you were going down that path, this is one of the characters that you could use that would reliably kill things. So you take a Chaos Lord, probably in Terminator armor, you give him a Lightning Claw and a Power Sword, and then you swap the Power Sword for the Relic Distortion. You give him the Flames of Spite Warlord trait, and then you give him an Intoxicating Elixir as a second relic, because as long as you don't give him a demon weapon, you can give a character two relics. The Chaos Lord in Terminator armor has six attacks. He gains D3 from his Elixir for up to nine attacks, and then with Distortion, he gets 18 hit rolls. Hitting on an unmodifiable two plus for an average of 15 hits, he then rolls to wound with rerolls, and any six to wound does a mortal wound in addition. This is an average of around five mortal wounds if you reroll aggressively, and an average of around five wounds to a toughness four target at AP2 with another five at AP3. So this cheeky extra attack from the Lightning Claw as well, this is around 18 dead guardsmen, six dead marines, about 10 unsaved wounds to a T7 vehicle. He's not quite the master of possessions from the old Empress Children list, but he's close in offensive output and way, way tougher. Plus he can make cunts fight last. So this Chaos Lord, he's something that you could put in the middle of that Terminator brick and send him out as well as the Terminators out. And the turn that you do that, he's gonna be able to make something fight last. Terminators then blow up whatever they just charged. That thing can't interrupt. And then when he fights, he's gonna be able to reliably blow up things, small things like rhinos, which is gonna get you your victory points from that secondary, or he's gonna be able to obliterate squads of smaller things. He's even going to be able to reliably take out small Space Marine squads, so or Space Marine characters. So he's quite a powerful little nugget that you can send out and he can do serious damage. All right, now let's get on to some potential list ideas. Now, I've chalked up a whole ton of different lists and a whole bunch of different stuff for different legions, different factions, all kinds of things. So this is just one of the many examples of the Emperor's children at their best. Now, there's going to be some elements in this list that I haven't covered in this video. The elements that I covered in other videos. So if you want to know more about my holistic understanding of Chaos Space Marines, check out the other videos on this channel because this one was specifically tooled to the Empress Children. So let's go through the list together, shall we? So you start with the Supreme Command Detachment with the big man himself 
Abbott on the despoiler. Now there's obviously I've done other videos on him. There's a lot of videos online. He's just an, almost an auto include in every Chaos Space Marine list. He's a very powerful unit in his own right. Then we go into an Emperor's Children Battalion. You take a Dark Apostle, you give him Mark of Slanesh and Illusory Supplication. So that's the, can't, re, can't hit on one, two or three and you can't reroll hits. Then you take a Master of Possession with the Mark of Slanesh. He takes Pact of Flesh and Mutated Invigoration. So Mutated Invigoration giving you the plus one toughness on your units and Pact of Flesh for Resurrection. And then you take Lucius the Eternal because he's just so points efficient and has an inbuilt ability to make things fight last. In your troop slots, you take two units of five noise marines, each with a single blast master and four bolters. You want to keep these units cheap. You want the blast master for some downrange shooting, but outside of these guys are mainly there for objective securing and providing support. Then in your third troop slot, you take five legionnaires with the Marcus Slanesh and you give one of them the Balefire Tomb for delightful agonies and prescience. So this is your way of getting delightful agonies, even though you don't have a sorcerer because the master of possessions doesn't have access to that tree. And this unit is going to sit back, they're going to hold your backfield objective and be pretty tough because they've got the three up save, armor of contempt, you put them in cover and you're just going to be dishing out delightful agonies and prescience with that unit. Then in your elite slot, you take one brick of 10 terminators, two of them get double accursed weapons and the champion takes the black rune. Now we didn't have the points in this list to put flamers on them, however that's something that you might want to consider. This is going to be your anvil. This is going to be the unit that's going to wrap around your characters and move up into the center of the table and get all of those buffs and be very, very difficult to deal with. Then in your other two elite slots, you take two units of 10 possessed. These guys are going to go up your flanks. They're going to bully enemy units. They're going to be your main damage dealers and they're going to be securing those outside objectives. And then finally, in your dedicated transport, you take a Rhino for the Noise Marines. And the reason you want to take a Rhino for the Noise Marines is it means that in the turn that they disembark, they get a nine inch move, which means if you want to be raising banners and the so sorts of things, you can do that from turn one because you can be jumping out onto objectives that are in the middle of the table. And it also means that if you move that Rhino up into the middle of the table, you're going to be able to disembark onto objectives and use your objective secured to secure those objectives and take them from your opponent. Now the other thing worth noting is that in this list I actually would advise against running Abbott on the Despoiler with the Terminators because for those of you who have seen the model he's on a 60 mil base which is quite large and if you have the Terminators wrapped around him it's gonna, you're going to move block yourself and Abaddon's essentially not going to be able to do anything because he can't move through the Terminators. All of your other characters are on a, a base that's smaller than two inches. So if you have the two inch gaps in your coherency, you can heroically intervene through, you can move through if you want to go charge something, you can do all kinds of crazy stuff. Abaddon is locked from doing that. So there's two ways that you can realistically run him. One of them is to run, run a reverse horseshoe. So you run the Terminators around like that with a 60 mil gap at the front, and then you put Abaddon in the middle. And Abaddon's still going to be protected from those from shooting and things like that because he's in the middle but you've left a gap big enough for him to come through that's cool the problem is is if your opponent then goes i'm going to hit you from the side abaddon can't heroic abaddon can't contribute and that's a bit of a problem so what i would advise with abaddon in this specific list is to put him in warp strike put him in deep strike and then you move your terminated brick up into the center of the table you put your um possessed out on the flanks when your opponent moves forward to deal with all of that threat in turn two, you deep strike Abaddon behind them. And now Abaddon's on his own, but he's okay on his own because he can only suffer three wounds a phase. So people aren't gonna be able to just put him down easily. And if they do decide to turn around and go back with their units to try to deal with Abaddon, well, that allows you to then push up and pin them in their own deployment zone. And if you're having the fight in their deployment zone while you control the entire table with your noise marines that have now moved out, your rhino that's moved out, now you've just won the game because you control the table. So the way I see this list working is Abaddon is almost like a deterrent. You drop him down where you want your opponent to go and they'll go there to deal with him. Or alternatively, if your opponent sees that trick and thinks, no, that's a trap, I'm not going to go back and kill Abaddon. I'm going to keep fighting with these Terminators, keep fighting with these Possessed. Well, then Abaddon is free to come up from the rear and hit their characters that are likely behind, hit all of their you know, backfield screening units. And sure, he's only going to kill a couple of them, but it's worth it for the fact that it's going to be guaranteed kills and it's going to stop your opponent from holding their backfield whilst you keep the fight in the middle. So either way, you're going to have a contested middle 
you're going to hold your backfield and theirs, which is a win, or you're going to have an uncontested middle, you're going to hold your middle, and there's going to be a contest in their backfield. So either way, that's a winning strategy. So I think the way to wield Abaddon is to deep strike him in the back. Your Terminators and your Possessed move up to control the midfield. Your Noise Marines are there to support and be reactive, to drop out where they need to drop those obsec models, where they need to put those four damage Blastmasters downrange and support. And then your Legionnaires are to hold your backfield and cast those powerful Prescience Delightful Agonies on the units that require them. So that's the way I see this list being wielded. And I actually think that they take this list to a GT and it's a potentially like event winning list. It's gonna struggle into certain matchups, but every list does. And it's all about just finding your ways to play around them and finding the best way to get the most damage and the most utility and the most points out of those units. So that's my thoughts on the Empress Children. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Make sure to chuck comments below if you think I've missed anything or if you think there's any particular Empress Children combos that you like. I definitely look forward to reading your comments. It's where I get a lot of the information which I'll use for future videos. So we have a bit of a dialogue here. It's not just me talking to a camera, it's me talking to you. Um, so let me know what you think in the comments. And also, if you enjoyed this video, they do take a lot of time to record and even longer to edit. They require a lot of equipment and a lot of software. So please head over to our Patreon. You can sign up for as low as $1 a month, which is 25 cents a day, which is fuck all. But if enough people do that, that'll allow me to continue doing this and continue to get better and evolve, evolve my process. So it's very much appreciated. Head over and show your support. And if you'd like to show your support as well, check out the video at the end, which is an advertisement for my neoprene objective markers. Now, if you support, if you want to show some support in a way that gives you something direct, purchasing those neoprene objective markers also supports the channel. And it also gives you a little memento, something that you can use in games and something that's very highly valuable and useful. So either way you want to show your support, it's appreciated. And I'll talk to you guys in the next video. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, yeah, I'll see you soon. Do your objective markers ever get lost behind terrain or other models and become difficult to see? Do they ever get bumped and accidentally moved during a game? And do they ever spark arguments about distances? Well, not anymore. Introducing the blog for the blood god, not even remotely patented, neoprene objective markers. Made from the same material as astronaut suits, or maybe military equipment, or probably neither of those things, this 2mm thick neoprene synthetic rubber is tear resistant, water resistant, and is designed to last. But that's not all, the blog for the blood god, not even remotely patented neoprene objective markers come in a variety of different designs and styles to suit any faction represented in the Warhammer 40,000 universe. These objective markers are a perfect gift for yourself or a friend and are a perfect way to flex and show your opponent that not only are you a smarter, cooler and better 40k player than them, but you also have more disposable income than they do. For the low price of $25, you'll get not one, not two, but six neoprene objective markers perfectly designed for 9th edition Warhammer 40k. But wait, there's more. For a limited time only, People who sign up on Patreon to support Blog for the Blood God as a Skull Champion tier $5 per month member will gain access to a custom design service where I will design a unique logo to support their gaming club like the one I did to the left here for the Potato Farmers local gaming club here in Melbourne. Follow the links in the description of this video to pick up your set today.